Oh, hi. Yeah, thanks everyone. That was uh, super cool to have that kind of jamboree style, super quick intro to everyone. Uh, welcome to the discussion. Um, so now we have the open discussion, exploring online learning, labor and, and cooperation uh, within the alternative art school. So I would ask, um, I think I'm right in doing this. I'm gonna ask everyone viewing to change to gallery view. I hope, I hope that's the right thing I'm gonna be doing. Um, and there have been some great questions and comments and stuff in the chat. Please keep uh, comments and questions coming. I'm going to keep my eye on that. If it's a question, put question before the question. And if it's a comment, put comment before the comment, just so, yeah, we kind of know. Um, and yeah, first up is Catherine Harrington from All MFA, um, who is going to start a chat on online education. So uh, over to Catherine, I think. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, so I'm Catherine Harrington. My pronouns are she and her. So I think with all of us being at home more lately, we've all been expanding our art development uh, by looking at online learning. So the question is, what have these experiences taught us? I think we've heard some great ideas during the Jamboree, but I wanted to ask, how can online learning support a kind of real vision for learning about art? So, who could we start with? We're looking for people to comment. So Emma, were you going to be able to move us or? Oh, to what, sorry? I mean, what? Uh, so people, I think people are going to comment now. I'm going to ask people to comment in our group. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, so direct, direct okay. some questions, yeah. Okay, good, so that is my question. You know, how can online learning support a kind of a vision? about our learning. Who has any ideas about that? I'm, sh I'm sure you do because we heard some great ideas during the Jamboree. It looks like John, John at Studio L does. He's put his hand up. Okay, great. John? Hi, yes. Um, am I here? Yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, I, I think it's been sort of a, a brilliant uh, opportunity. I think um, back in 2015 when we started uh, online learning, um, you know, I think people just kind of look at you like you're you're sort of a little um, maybe the word the right the right word isn't crazy, but just you know, especially within studio in studio art, I think they just think that it can't work. Um, I think we, the tide has turned, and I think people are starting to see that these things can work. But ultimately, I think you know, I think online learning off, uh, offers time and space and most and, and and mostly flexibility. I mean, people have jobs, people have kids, people have to teach their kids at home now. It's like it's, so. It's like I think it just it gives us a time to check in and check out uh, and, and, and offers us these, these great moments. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's really true. Um, now, I think Elle, you were mentioning that you had some examples of that. Do you have, could you offer that for us? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about um, two things that first of all, um, perhaps online learning, you know, it has this other form of communication as we all know a different form of communication. And I think um, it might, it might uh, suit some uh, of us that might be um, termed uh, shy radicals. And um, to, to use a, a phrase that I've obviously taken uh, from, from a book, but um, I was just thinking about different ways of forms of communication. There is a particular form of communication. And I think it's, uh, it, 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 it takes a little bit of getting used to um, and, ha and then once we get used to it, if we ever do get used to it, maybe different ways that we can uh, utilize it. Uh, but one of the projects that I have observed recently is um, uh, something that was involved with called silent questions. And I work with a, a choreographic group um, of uh, MA students in um, Vienna and uh, gave them uh, instructional directions so we all had our uh, little Zoom boxes, our own windows in our own spaces. And I was um, reading out instructions in terms of movement. And they were then participating in this, um, uh, these instructions. And I worked with a choreographer, Charlotte, Charlotte Ruth, uh, who's based in, um, based in uh, Switzerland. Um, so we worked this, yeah, with the MA students in Vienna. Uh, Charlotte is in, based in Switzerland and I was, um, instigating the silent questions. Um, and it, you know, we, we, we worked on this for uh, uh, probably about an hour in terms of a, a performative piece of work. 
Mm. Um, so I think, I thought, yeah, I thought that was quite uh, a really exciting um, example of what the possibilities are once one can start to think beyond just the face. Yeah, I really agree. That sounds really fantastic. Really, really interesting. And um, yeah, just looking over at the sides, there's um, from the, the Feral Art School. Do you mind to say something about your experiences? Uh, I think that's yes, Jackie. But yes, yeah. Um, we, I mean, we have very little experience of online learning, but as I said in the comment, um, we realize now how important that that facility is, um, not that we would ever uh, want to only be teaching online. Um, so we are thinking about setting up other sorts of courses online, but um, in our case, really, um, the question is, it's a question of resourcing it because mm. there's nothing more irritating than having a not very good online platform that doesn't do the job properly. So it's, a, you know, it's an additional, um, rather than being something that is integrated in, in our activities at the moment, it's an additional uh, challenge. So it just depends on whether or not we feel we can take that on and resource it somehow. Mm. I don't know whether people have that sort of, uh, that sort of challenge. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, um, Fernando, maybe you could speak about the Ultim FA example. Um, yes, that was pretty low tech, but it did work. Absolutely. I mean, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but yep, indeed, the, can hear you. The, I mean, to me, what the first residency doing online, and I mean, most people after the, when the pandemic hit, everybody started working online and then you spend your your day job online and then the last thing you want to do is carry on doing your meetings online so a, a lot of people get tired of it but surprisingly it worked pretty good and the, the whole residency even though we were isolated in individual when we have our meetings it was very fruitful and very I mean I, I got almost as if we were all together in the same room you know as all the time it was um, a it's brilliant exercise I think it's one of because you have to think about the future and how we want to embrace this new media and how we want to continue working with this because it's a power, it looks like a, we want to continue having these um, situations. You know? mm -hmm. And I believe um, it puts us together and maintains us together for the health, mentally health, you know, for our group cohesives in, mm -hmm. in all our development in the same mm -hmm. manner. I mean, we just okay. need to adapt to the current times, to this yeah. normal. Yeah, I think that's true. It was a really positive experience. How about Lisa, Lisa Rahman? Could we hear from you? Um, yeah, I think what, what I loved about what we did during Made Up School was um, it was embracing the lo-fi technology. Um, instead of posting everything, let's say, directly onto social media, it was keeping everything quite private in our spaces so that we could just talk about it. It wasn't showcasing what we're doing to the whole world yet. Um, and one thing we did was for our private view, uh, we had a Google document um, and we, we all attended the private view on that Google document at a certain time on a Friday um, and then the only way we were able to interact was via the chat, the small little chats that you have on a Google Doc. Um, so we didn't see anyone. We were just reacting through. It was kind of like using MSN Messenger when you were young. Um, and there was something really instinctive and lovely about just focusing on the work. It wasn't about us as people. It was about us showcasing what we'd done and then using the limitations of the technology that we did have. Mm, that sounds really, really positive. That sounds great. And what about Mickey Shaw? I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. Hi. Um, yeah, I was um, uh, thinking recently how uh, I, I think this whole, you know, terrible experience of the pandemic has opened our eyes to, you know, the possibilities 
um, of doing things online. I mean, just for our group, as I, I mentioned in our talk, the fact that we're geographically spread out, um, and that, yeah, I had cost implications for some members of the group, the travel costs of coming to meetings, it was very limiting. And also for me, I've got two young kids, so I'm quite limited about times I can get out and I can pretty much not get to most private views if I wanted to go to them because they're just completely wrong time for families. Um, but, you know, suddenly you can get to something, you've got something that's just an hour, a random time of day and you can make it because it's online. Um, I think this is, um, the accessibility is really amazing and I think there's also a lot of disability groups who have said, this is what we were campaigning for all the time and now suddenly everyone's realised, you know, it is possible if we just put a bit of effort into it. So, you know, I'm just hoping that we're all going to take this experience and, and use it much more to expand what, what we can offer and who we can open it out to. Yeah, yeah, that sounds, that sounds really great. I mean, one of the issues um, that, that seems to come up is, you know, we're not meeting face to face, but there, there does seem to be some ways around that, you know, through um, online studios, um, the, like we're doing now. Um, I'm wondering if anyone's got some ideas about how to kind of just try to create the, the formation of a group um, with online learning and create that kind of interaction. Uh, let me see now. The, um, with Maria, Maria Bird, I'm looking at your, there's something in the chat from you. I, I was just echoing um, uh, L. Reynolds' point about shy radicals and um, what it's like to be able to contribute like I'm doing now without people seeing my face. It's been lovely. All right. Okay. That's great. That's great. So um, how are we for time? I'm just um, really wondering if we've missed somebody. I wanted to have uh, an inclusion of, of uh, well, comments ten, from everyone. Ten more minutes. I think um, there's Matthew, Con uh, Matthew Conditions has an interesting comment to make. Oh, I'm sorry if I interrupted someone. 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. So Matthew, Matthew conditions. I just comment and um, just reflecting on conditions started um, just over a year and a half ago. So obviously no one was expecting um, what's happened in the last six months to happen. Um, but just reflecting on some of my experiences of teaching in, in undergraduate university art education, um, I mean, I had experiences of students, you know, living in very expensive accommodation saying, I, I, my room is not big enough to have a desk and a bed. I can only have one, so I have to have a bed. Um, and this kind of in parallel with um, universities essentially wanting to get rid of studio space for, for most practice-based art courses. I mean, I think <laughs> they're not necessarily practice-based if, if, if they end up not having any kind of like physical space that they work in. And, and so I'm, I'm not at all against like the um, um, the opening up of accessibility and, and flexibility with online connectivity and, and we've done a kind of hybrid model with conditions recently. Um, but I, I do also think that where possible the the you know the the human like communion of, of being in a space with people and not having everyone's voice, uh, you know, <laughs> Zoom has a particular sound where everyone's voice sounds the same. It comes through a, a voice compressor. All of these like very subtle things and the fact that every other aspect of, of, of your kind of administrative and, um, uh, I don't know, entertainment, communicative life is filtered through exactly the same piece of technology, your, your laptop or your tablet. I think, you know, for me, I think those things are still kind of are very important. So it's not kind of throwing out questions of accessibility, which, which I agree have been actually a, available for, for, for years and years and have, have been kind of um, not implemented as quickly as they could be. But I definitely think that a hybrid model um, is, is important. Yeah. Yeah. I really understand that about accessibility. It, it can help to open things up, which I think we can try to, 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 to work with. Um, I think there's a comment here uh, from Stephanie. Um, could you expand upon your point about the early open university model? Yeah, um, it kind of, this conversation is taking me straight back to discussions with colleagues in the WEA and at the Co-op College around the Adult 100 report 
on the 1919 Ministry of Reconstruction around adult education and leading into the, you know, the history and traditions of the Open University with Stuart Hall. And I'm just thinking perhaps the, the platforms are reflecting the motivations for learning and it just feels as if the, the history of the OU was very much rooted in a more humble, reflective, self-meaningful practice that had more collectivity. And in some ways, it just feels as if the conversation is missing a whole history and a tradition of this form of practice that, that took place in those early days of OU. And I'm thinking of the time when a lot of the material then found its way onto television and people would sit quietly and study and share and discuss. Or I may be missing something. Yeah, no, I think the Open University, it's an incredible model. And um, uh, does anyone have anything to say about the, Stephanie's comment about that, the OU? I mean, I always found it amazing. You could turn on the television at three in the morning and there would be this incredible speak, like you said, Stuart Hall, you know, speaking, um, just really fantastic. And so, yeah, so going back, is there any comments that, if you want to make any comments, please put something in the, in the box um, at the chat on the side. Um, I think I'll, I'm, if I've missed anyone, um, the um, James from School of the Dam, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, um, so the, the, the main conversation that we've had as a school at the moment has been about whether we should go online and the pitfalls that, that kind of brings up, partly because it's not what people signed up for. Um, and like being in the same physical space is such a big part of the school and going to different cities and all this kind of thing. Um, so really, yeah, it's just been a conversation that we've had um, to see if it can go online and how that would actually happen, like what parts can go online. Um, and also, obviously, there's a lot, lots of people with different um, different opinions about that and have different needs. So there's like obviously some anxiety about using like programs like Zoom and things. Um, but what we have found is that using smaller groups, because there are 30 of us, using smaller groups of like five to 10 people um, to talk about smaller things rather than trying to solve these big problems with the school has really helped and just having more like social time with each other mm -hmm. through through things like zoom to do like things like a, a video club where we just talk about a film or these kind of things have really helped far more than you know trying to organize a massive 30 person meeting online which I think a lot of our class would just find too daunting um, and just trying to organize that as well has been quite hard um, yeah, I think that's kind of where we are with being online anyway. Yeah, no, I, I think that aspect about online, um, the informal learning um, is really important and how to try to get that kind of informality and in chat um, when you're on screen like this um, is, um, has really, you know, has some so it's it and and the, the whole platform as people were saying now i know um john ross you because you've been doing this for over five years do you have any tips for people um for our group um in terms of setting up online learning um yeah i mean maybe you know it doesn't have to be perfect straight away i mean you know we've we've learned as we've gone through and and we've started small so you know our first course we offered i think had four students um, and was a 10 week, you know, 10 week long term. Um, and, and you grow and you, and you challenge yourself and, and you kind of learn what you need, um, you know, and, and like, it's okay to fail and, and start from scratch. You know, I think that those are really important, important moments to, to remember. Um, so I, I, I have a few, you know, I have, I have a few thoughts on like, you know, the possible um, downsides to learning too. Am I allowed to talk about that or is, do we not have time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's about overcoming downsides but yeah what can we do I just, the, the, the two things i mean cost is an issue obviously with everything i think also availability of tech to students and to artists you know so how do how do you uh you know partner with organizations or local libraries to, to make sure that people have access to tech i think the other big thing that we really have to be mindful of is big tech co-opting platforms 
and like data right. and like our own surveillance and privacy because yeah. you know i mean i think we, that's a big issue that we all have to really consider so you know we host everything we have our own server that costs money but everything yeah. is private so i think okay. those are things to think about right right okay i think we're on to the maybe the last comment and um uh jessica elmel um can we call upon you to make a final comment hi hi uh, yeah so i was just um highlighting that sophie who wanted sorry could you speak up it's a little bit faint hello can you hear me yeah if you speak loudly yeah so i was just making a comment about um that sophie had to switch the into the wild program from offline to online midway through um the course so i think that was like a really big we really quickly um had to adapt to this um new environment and we responded by um i think sophie and and people we organized um artists doing workshops sending out materials so then it's not dependent on who has what materials in their house to make to kind of even out that democrat that more democratically but i don't know if sophie wants to add something hmm. do we have a minute uh any time for sophie we're just about to move on to the next section catherine okay okay so um Maybe we should um, leave Sophie unless you've got like 15, 20 seconds of something to say. We're, we're gonna move on to the next section okay, now. Okay, sorry. All right, okay, well, thank you everybody for making comments. That was really, really intense, but uh, fascinating. Thanks a lot. Oh, hey, okay, yeah, thanks, Catherine. That was really fascinating. I think, um, yeah, we, we, I put in the comment that we kind of moved our program. Um, online but we put it complete like we put our in real life program completely on pause and we were lucky enough to have Morgan Quaintance uh, take us through the Yale literary theory um, section so that's amazing online learning actually if anyone wants to get involved in the Yale stuff it's it's fantastic and completely mm -hmm. free so I should check that out um, so cool what are we on now we're on labor okay not Tony Blair, but work. Um, so how do alternative schools sustain themselves? I think, um, you know, I set up Toma in 2016. And to me, it's been really, really interesting to see um, all the kind of different ways that they're set up. They're all completely run in different ways from like, um, unpaid labor, shared labor, skill swapping, paid for staff, institutionally backed, you know, it's a whole combo. And I think um, that's something that really interests me. Um, so for me, um, I do most of the labor at Toma. I am paid for my time. I apply for arts council grants, project grants to pay for the most part of my time. Um, but I am definitely not paid, uh, properly, <laughs> but that's my own problem and I need to sort that out. Um, and, you know, we do rely on some, um, kind of kindness as well. So we have volunteers that come in um, and host the Toma project space, which is um, our public space in a shopping center in South End, but we swap time with them so they can use the space upstairs um, uh, to make work and to um, photograph work in exchange for spending time uh, downstairs in vigilating the space. So we're always thinking about swapping or financial exchange as well. It's shit. We live in a capitalist society. I'm trying to work out how to not live in that way. But, you know, we're transparent with the money and how the labor is um, shared and all those things. And I think transparency is kind of the best way maybe to get around that. Um, but I've got some people I want to direct questions to. And first one is James slash Maddie. So I don't know who wants to answer this. Um, but I know School of the Dam works super different to Tacoma um, and uh, kind of share labor. Um, and it is completely run by the group. Uh, no money is exchanged. So it would be great to hear a little bit about how that works. OK, hi. Um, yeah, we don't. Um, do any like money things we just do like and we've only just started we've had one proper meetup so lots of this is just what we've learned from previous years or what's been passed down um but we do because there's like travel costs and stuff meeting in different cities um we tend to do labor exchanges for like the venues or any speakers or art artists that we'd have for any events we'd do or anything um, and that can work on like time for time I think that's what they've done in the past 
Um, yeah, the, the, one, the one meeting that we did have was just pre-COVID. So we haven't actually done the labor exchange yet as everyone's situation has changed and the venue situation has changed and everything. Um, but yeah, so time for time, or I guess depending on the, what we're swapping, it might be different. Um, yeah, and then we do, for like labor within the school, we do, um, because there's like 30 people, we tend to divide into smaller groups to tackle the jobs within the school. Um, yeah. Um, and then also we would talk in our last meeting, we talked about um, skill swapping. So instead of, to sort of like share our learning and stuff. Um, I don't know if there's anything else to say. I was gonna ask like who, who does the what jobs no one wants to? Like how do you share that out? Like washing up or like cleaning up a space after you've been there? Cause I'm sure not like everyone's like, woohoo, I'm gonna yeah. do I mean, like, So far it's kind of been fine. Like um, people have offered to make food for the group or, and we've all kind of like pitched in for the cleaning and um, it, so far it's worked. I don't know how, um, on online it's sort of because we kind of paused a little bit it's hard to say um like how much like who's going to take the jobs that no one wants to do because there's not that much going on at the moment um yeah i guess we just we just like try and negotiate and not let one person do all of the admin or not let one person do all of this rubbish jobs rubbish jobs yeah um, <laughs> Yeah. See, it's always interesting kind of that group dynamic share though isn't it like it's like when you do a, a group project at school right like yeah. there's always two people that like do everything and then the other people are like woohoo yeah we did it yeah. like yeah I don't know just yeah wondering if that if that happens with you but I suppose because you've only kind of met once so far. yeah we met we met for our handover and then we um met yeah then we had one meeting and that was kind of a big, a big chat meeting because we kind of need to figure out what we want to do. So it was, yeah, there was lots of things on our to-do list that we divvy, divvied up between people, but that to-do list has kind of been changed a little bit. Ripped up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right um, cool. James, did you want to add anything um, to what Maddie said? I think you explained it really well, Maddie. Yeah, I think Maddie covered most of it. I would say um, part of the labour exchange also is just to have um, independence from any organisation um, and also, as Maddie said, cutting the costs down. Obviously, there's still travel expenses when we go to somewhere like Manchester or London for people to, to get up there, but it's just a way to keep it as, you know, um, independent and as um, cost effective as, as we can, really. Um, as we don't have any like permanent base or like physical presence, um, that also brings down the cost, but it does also mean a lot of what we offer our students isn't necessarily like facilities, but the opportunity to, you know, um, get people in and then through that labor exchange, try and find a fair way of, you know, paying someone for their labor. Um, and that's always been a kind of negotiation and conversation that we have to have with individuals or spaces to you know make sure that they're not taking advantage of anyone who's offering to do work for them and also we're not taking advantage of them you know um it might be a case of if we're taking up the space that we could do some work for them or some workshops but also like rejigging someone's whole website which i think last year did for a couple of people is a lot of labor for only certain people within the group who have those skills so it's really just finding that kind of fair balance which I think does, you know, it takes quite a lot of work um, and it's just like constantly ongoing. Yeah, no, we've got some great comments in, um, in the chat here. Jai um, is saying um, that, um, yeah, working in groups can be tricky if you're not taught how. Um, and Jai, you've been um, developing some workshops. I would love to do one of these workshops. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? You don't have to. <laughs> Any of you want to? Um, I can do, yeah. I'm cooking in the background, so I'm not going to put my camera on. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I was, I've been, I don't know, I've had an experience of working in group. I feel like everyone I speak to has got an experience of working in a group where they're like, oh, it wasn't successful or it was frustrating. And particularly 
in kind of education settings, um, being told to like go and work on this, work as a group. And then um, the people who have set that task, like often lecturers or teachers are really frustrated because they have to deal with all the niggles. So yeah, at the moment I'm just working with a friend to think about how we can teach that. So we've been doing some like, yeah, basically workshops around collaboration and like a really clear skill set and just passing on some tools um, for yeah, how you can do that really productively and still get on and still like each other at the end. So yeah, I'm happy as it develops. I can always share it on my Instagram or something if people want to keep in the loop with that. Oh oh yeah, and please email it direct to me like as well. That yeah, that would be great. It sounds real. I'm I'm up for that. Um, Thank you, James and Maddie. Um, I also wanted to um, have a quick chat with uh, Matthew from Conditions. Um, we've been exchanging some emails about labor um, and I wanted um, Matthew just to talk a bit about how you share the wo workload in your organizational group because I believe there's two of you uh, organizing, doing the admin slash housework. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's very similar to what you're describing, Emma, with um, Toma. Uh, it, it, it's predominantly me who does the kind of administration and organization for conditions and that's you know that, that was how it was kind of set up at the beginning because we're not a um, uh, you know we're not, we're not a collaboratively formed group um, it was a it was a call for people who were interested to have a studio and be part of, of what we were proposing um, so within that there is there is a lot of um, intergroup conversation there has been some um things that we've done that are kind of fully collaborative within the group i mean i i, I kind of agree with, with the comments about um um people assume that collaboration is a kind of de facto good thing but you're actually never really um told particularly how to do it or maybe there isn't the time to think about how to do it and, and i can kind of echo that from my own experience in, in teaching outside of conditions so so what am i trying to say i mean i'm trying to say that we have a kind of we have a bit of a mixed model in conditions in that one part of conditions is that um it's important that when people come to their studio here and they speak with each other or they speak with someone who is who is coming to visit conditions as an artist or a critic or a writer etc um that, that they're coming here because they are an artist and they want to pursue their art practice um, and, and not because everybody is engaged with um, bureaucratic questions of how an institution runs and, and can run. So, I mean, so we, and we started it very quickly, um, mainly because we had to, because it's based in a, in a physical building. Um, so there wasn't really the time to have um, a huge amount of um, kind of planning other than working out how to do to do what we wanted to do as simply as possible so it is very very simple um, business model if you like um, people people pay for a studio space and and on top of that um, we run this program of something that loosely takes it mo its model from from our education um, studio visits discussions crits um, etc we did a show that was the, the whole group um, last year we did a an off-site uh, virtual reality project um, which was probably the most kind of intense and difficult collaborative um, project because uh, going back to the comments about building a website it, it was you know very uneven distribution of labor because it required some certain technical skills um, that you know fell on fell on one or two people um, but I mean, ultimately, they they were they were successful, and um, I mean, they were they were experiences that have been sustaining in terms of things to come back to. And it, so, in terms of um, going forwards, it's not um, it's probably not sustainable long term like this. So that's something I'm really aware of as the person who who, who does most of the kind of like organising within conditions. Um, is that we need we need to either have other modes of income um, and we don't really want to do that by just having more artists as our customers we'd actually like to move to a model where the people that work with conditions as artists are not 
for customers, if, if, if you kind of see what I mean. Um, I, hate, I hate that term. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, <laughs> like, if you have a business, you know, you, basically that's, that's where our income comes from, from people mm. you know, for studio space. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're thinking about how to have a, kind of, how to have a mixed economy. Um, we don't receive that much funding. Croydon Council supports us, which is very helpful. Um, but that support goes directly to, um, it, it reduces the cost for people who are 25 and under, so they, they pay 40% less. Um, so it doesn't really go to running, running the programme, it just goes to making it more affordable to people who are, who are in it. Yeah, that's super uh, important. And it's always really interesting, like hearing how, how complex all these kind of economies are within all the alternative art schools, like an economy is not just financial ones, but like this sharing of unpaid labor and stuff. And, and so thank you, Matthew, I wanted to just move it over to um, L Reynolds, actually, who's researching um, alternative art school spaces. Um, and just ask a, a little bit about what are your experiences in all the alternative art schools on like how the labor's shared. I mean, I know we've only got a few, a few minutes left, so you probably can't put it all in, but have you got anything you'd like to share? Um, I don't know. I, I always think about you, Emma, to be honest. And um, um, yeah, I was thinking about um, three words uh, that sort of the monodisciplinary, the multidisciplinary and the, um, pluridisciplinary and I was thinking about you as this you know the, the, the monodisciplinary is the person who has just the practice and they're doing the practice and I was watching a um, documentary yesterday online uh, presentation of Jeremy Della's work and I was thinking this is really mono this is a kind of you know a rich practice but it seems quite a mono practice and then I was thinking about the multidisciplinary artist practice and then your practice, which is this pluridisciplinary, you know, you, you are the artist, you, you are the um, researcher, environmentalist, curator, administrator, um, fundraiser, social activist, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a lot of the models that I've seen, um, the ones that I've been drawn to perhaps are being run by um, a, a singular person or somebody who seems to be pushing um uh and pulling so uh, i was thinking about also university of the underground i think i mentioned them earlier in amsterdam and nelly ben who you um Hayum, who's uh, instigated that to some extent but it, i know she gets support from the sandberg institute um but she she is you know one of these pluridisciplinary uh practitioners um, so, yeah, I think I've been drawn to those the pluridisciplinary, but there are other um, uh, methodologies in it. And, and, and I think Matthew Skill of the Damned has described this kind of, you know, the group uh, horizontal approach. But I think, um, yeah, the ones that the, certainly the ones I've been looking at are led by these really um, pluridisciplinary artist practitioners. Oh, thanks. You made me blush. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm just gonna hand over to. Um, I had a question for um, Amy as well. Amy Pennington, who um, has been working with uh, Solidarity Syndicate, um, and I just wanted to ask a little bit about how you folks shared the labour over there, because I'm assuming there was no money involved in setting that up. And and much like Matthew was saying, you know, setting up really fast. Like I set up Toma really fast as well. In direct response to something and you you were setting up in direct response weren't you yeah so it's probably clunky as well as things are when they're done in direct response but i think it's important to make a stand and just to go for it and just try your best with the best integrity and i think for that because it was so fast it was like whatsapp group you know set up and it was what skills people had you know can you draw something you can figure out the media stuff try and set the campaign up like that who's good at copy um yeah there was no money in it and we just really went with what skills we all had and i think especially when you're setting something up in direct response like that there's a great energy that comes out of that so people are willing to do stuff it's not like the dregs of oh god it's got to this point where nobody's doing anything so it's it's good to have that kind of enthusiasm and that rush and 
yeah just thrill of actually doing something rather than let something happen to you so i think it does have a good energy especially in the start of things yeah the adrenaline kind of uh yeah drives you through doesn't it like yeah, yeah being a bit naughty you know <laughs> that's good for for us isn't it and i mean how what was the time scale in setting it up in, in, until you kind of announced what was happening can you remember I think it was like a week or two weeks. It was really fast, maybe a couple of weeks and then kind of figuring out like how to explain it even like more simply and how it could work. But I mean, it was just an, like a, an idea like, oh, I remember I think my mum used to do like a lottery syndicate and it was just a way of like at her work that she'd get to kind of like potentially win the lottery. And it's just kind of ironic that, you know, a lot of the arts council money does come from scratch cards and the lottery so why don't we just turn it on its head a little bit um so yeah it was very in response and fast um, uh, yeah i like that and and just quickly kind of what what is next for the group we've got a minute left Are the, have you got any plans or? yeah well we've made a video that kind of goes into the next stage of what it could be but i think that we're really interested in looking at what are the alternatives of non-competition and how can we do that and researching into different models of other people that have done it well or other countries or other you know cooperatives and pulling some of those resources together and just having a space to learning about that for how we move forward you know after the pandemic and what we want to do so I guess we're just at the stage of chatting about alternatives yeah okay thank you so we've yeah come to the end of our time but if anyone wants to share um any research or reading on alternative economies like i know i'd be super interested to read that but um i think a lot of us would as well so if anyone's got any research or links they want to share please do it in the chat um thanks everyone for sharing um next up we have uh sophie chapman um jessica Al elmau and sam lanchin i hope i'm saying sam's surname right um <laughs> Uh, who are going to talk about cooperation, which leads on nicely from what Amy was just talking about. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, so I think uh, when we were invited to think and talk a bit about cooperation, it felt only natural to uh, do it in dialogue with two of the current Into the Wild group. So yeah, Sam and Jess, do you want to just briefly introduce yourselves and your kind of relationship to this idea of cooperation? Are you unmuted? <laughs> Hi, I'm, Sam. Um, I'm an artist based in Leeds and I kind of I collaborate with an artist called Sam Ramayanja um, as a performance duo, um, Sam 1, Sam 2. And I guess I'm also invo involved in other kind of organising groups up in Leeds. So can I work at a workers' co-op? I also um, run help run freehold projects, which was, I mean, prior to it being closed, um, was like an um, artist-led space in Leeds. So yeah, so I kind of, yeah, kind of um, involved in... Yeah, virtual organisation. Great, thanks. Jess, do you want to go? Um, yeah, hi, I'm Jess. I'm based in Manchester. Um, and I, like, all my work is um, collaborative, not always with artists, sometimes with gardeners or scientists or uh, shoppers, um, and that's um, I'm really interested in how art can collaborate with any uh, a multitude of, of people and environments. Great. Yeah, cooperation, I think, has been a really key part of how we've thought about Into the Wild this year in particular, um, not just sort of in our group uh, dynamic itself, but also thinking about how it can be um, more embedded in arts practice in general, this kind of idea that keeps coming up, right, about non-competitive um, practices and how, how you can actually include that in how you make your work and sort of everything about your, um, your art. Uh, so I wanted to ask you both, and then maybe we can open it up to anybody else who had any comments. Um, in that respect, like what in your experience do you think is the most important thing that you need to sort of leave room for when you're in a collaborative or cooperative group? Jess, do you want to go first? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I am very passionate about um, the fact that we need to plan in uh, moments for rest and moments for um, 
like non-work in. So I think we, when we start cooperative or collaborative groups, we're so passionate about like the project and the work scheme and what we're going to do and when we basic needs like eating, uh, taking a walk, taking a breath, and that these moments are actually what will um, like solidify the group and it will take whatever it is that you're working on and whatever your aims, it will actually take it to the next level. So I always like make a joke and be like, oh, you know, pizza can never go wrong, but it actually can. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that thing of like giving space for unexpected things to happen is like, yeah, what the sort of alternative part of alternative art education should be about, right? Rather than this really sort of overly planned or didactic thing. Sam, did you have anything to say about yeah kind of like kind of bouncing off what you guys have said i think it's also like the space to just do your own thing um i think i've kind of found with, with my collaborator um i found it really important to kind of give each other space to kind of just do our own or kind of concentrate on our own practices during certain times and not be concerned with kind of okay we're not doing enough together at this moment um but also kind of expanding off that it could also support each other in those own practices so kind of still working with each other to help um, work on applications for those individual projects or kind of bring each other in on opportunities um, as individuals rather than as doing something together. So I think it just feels really important uh, yeah, to give each other space and not feel pressure to kind of always be doing something together. And also just um, uh, just being like, flexible with the process. I think, I think so mm. often in organising groups you can kind of feel uh, like tired or like, kind of hindered by the process which you've set in place for yourself. And being like it's actually okay just be like, okay that worked for a, that worked for a while but like it no longer works now and it's fine mm. yeah definitely i think that's been quite liberating with how we've had to adapt under the current circumstances as well right like let's not just try and do that for the sake of doing it like what makes sense right now um i was going to open it up now to one of the other speakers mickey i wondered if you had anything to say in particular about like what you should leave space for in cooperation because I know that your group is a peer-led group um, right thanks um yeah I mean I was just like listening to all of that I was thinking that yeah what what I I feel seems to be the biggest challenge about uh collaboration and cooperation is communication mm. right that's that's really hard to do actually and 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 that's something we take for granted so talking about how to kind of teach these things um like one of the things that people will know in our group is that i'm quite a stickler for like facilitating and dividing up time fairly because i think some it's very easy for you know people communicate in very different ways have very different styles and sometimes we need to all be allotted our time and to be able to as uh, as it was mentioned before about making space for silence as well so there's so many different ways of communicating like even while this zoom is going on i'm thinking about how you've got the simultaneous <laughs> thing on video and oral and then also the type thing which is going on and i like i want to contribute to the type thing but i find i can't I have to get into a different zone to think in terms of writing and i can't mm. do that at the same time so i'm like okay i'm just going to do the oral and watching and the talking and that i have to engage with separately so so by the way i'm hoping that we can get maybe a transcript of the chat because i can't seem to copy it to read later um but it's that kind of thing you know there's so many different ways now which you communicate which is great because then with their different communication styles that makes room for more people but it's then the way that we can incorporate all those things and give enough sort of space and prominence to each mm -hmm. of those voices so i think that's always the challenge um uh, and the other thing is, of course, that it t every single group has its own dynamics that take time to establish. Now, what's lovely about with Juggernauts is that we've like really gotten to know each other over several years. So it just comes much easier and we forget how it took a while to get there. And I'm sure that as you know, the group changes and expands, every time you add new people, the dynamic shifts and you have to go through a whole set of new phases. I don't know if you know, there's these, you know, people have done analysis about or written theories about the way that groups work and there's like these four stages which are like forming storming norming and performing i think i don't know if you hadn't that. heard of that yeah. forget who if someone knows the attribution for that please put it in the thing <laughs> um but yeah that that's really you know when you start getting to know people everyone's all quite you know timid and let's you know everyone's being very polite and then gradually then you start maybe getting clashes of different personalities and then you find ways to work together and that's the same with every sort of relationship you have with a partner with children with you know family relationships with friends um so i find like communication is a thing that is hard across yeah. all our lives putting yourself in someone else's shoes 
definitely that's the challenge yeah that kind of leads on quite nicely in a way I, the next question i was going to ask um to sam and jess was i know that you both uh did your own solidarity syndicates um and so i wondered whether you could say a little bit about how that experience was like i bet there was a lot of like yeah you have to trust people and um be honest with each other about like your financial situation don't you and um yeah, Sam, in particular, I know that you were saying that you've actually used it to sort of start a pot that the group can draw on. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that's worked. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it was just, it came at a really good time because I think uh, it was when everything was slightly becoming too online and it felt kind of everything kind of was felt really quite surface level. So it felt like a solid action to do and something to kind of think about because these are conversations or that kind of the idea of collectivising money is something kind of that I've could have done with the, with the my collaborator who I perform with and that's a lot easier because we both kind of do the work as we both earn the money we kind of keep that money together and use it together openly use it individually so um we could have been speaking about how could we do this on a bigger scale and this with this with the sin when the syndicate came along it seemed like a good opportunity to trial that out and so kind of yeah quite early on in the conversations we kind of decided I think there's like six or six or seven of us in the group um that we kind of wanted to maybe treat this as a, as a bit more, more of a long-term project um, and rather than kind of dividing up the money equally once we got it or if we got it and we did get it um, to kind of do it more on a means basis and so but to be able to do that we kind of we kind of thought about like we're actually willing to uh, establish relationships with each other uh, where there's yeah like you said there's trust but we're also able to talk about uh, money in a really honest way um, so we kind of use some conscience raising techniques that kind of we'd worked with before and came up with some kind of questions that we kind of we've been working through like every two or three weeks um like what is those are some really good ones which came up they were like yeah um does the money you earn feel like yours what do you do for money how do you feel about money how do you feel when you give money what do you feel like when you receive money and just kind of trying to establish relationships uh which felt honest but kind of also kind of create a dynamic where you found it easier to kind of uh give and receive and i think that kind of it feels like money is kind of the final frontier. So kind of once you've already, once you've asked someone to kind of lend money, so it becomes a lot easier to kind of ask for uh, mm. anything else. And so kind of it just, yeah, it just it just kind of create a broader network um, to kind of share things with. That sounds so good. I think the conversation around money is so it's always so difficult, isn't it? Because everybody has like such specific circumstances, um, and the idea around solidarity syndicate in the beginning was kind of like, yeah, just asking people to trust each other that they need it and that they will support each other to get it. Um, yeah, how did you find it in yours, Jess? Um, so we were a mix of people who might be eligible, people who definitely weren't eligible, and then um, sort of people who were so eligible, they were like almost an organization. <laughs> and we worked it out. So that the people who were very, very, very eligible um, were actually then vouching to provide contracts for the rest of the syndicate. So even though um, the syndicate was, we were all successful um, and really what we gained from the syndicate more than the actual money was that, that finding that mix of very like semi-organizational level with very, um, you know, a very different range of people. It just put the, put us in contact with each other and it gave us like this mutual um, sort of ground to start talking about how we might support each other. And I think that that's what's carried on past the, um, the emergency funding and what will c hopefully continue, like could be forever now. Mm. I think that's a really nice point about the question like the open question of how, how can we support each other like and that support doesn't look the same for everybody or, and people need different levels of support at different times um i was going to ask you jackie in your experience with feral art school um yeah how how do you feel like the group makes that kind of space to support each other in the ways that they need um it, it's interesting and it's a learning journey because we're you, we look at, look at it on the one hand as um, a cooperative structure and given that we come out of a very hierarchical academic structure before that um, that takes quite a lot of thinking around if you're looking at it as a sort of 360 degree um, vision of cooperation and then on the other hand cooperative learning where um, students and um, 
tutors because we you know we have tutors and we have groups of students are involved in developing um courses uh, so it, it I suppose that that sort of conflicts in some ways with organisation as well, in that decisions have to be made and people have to do things. But what we found is that um, it's looking at people as equal members of that particular group where, yes, we're all artists, but we take different roles according to the things that are, you know, appropriate at the time that we're perhaps best at. So some of us do the admin, um, some of us do the teaching, um, we all um, share decision making and we try and draw the students into um, the whole process but it's quite you know it's quite a slow quite a slow journey in some ways um, and some people find it quite difficult to grasp that there is no hierarchy at all that we've all got contributions to make and um, you know the, the one thing that we do make um, that we do um, make sure that we do is to actually pay the artists well for tutoring so if anybody loses out I suppose to a certain extent it's the people that do other things apart from teaching but you know that's the same I think with any of the groups who have um, who have uh, uh, commented uh, today it's you know where you where you find the money to keep going from and how that's allocated but the basic principle is that everybody is equal yeah I think um, that relates a bit to what people were talking a bit before about labour, doesn't it? And that thing of like, yeah, the the things that get left or like, uh, you know, once everybody's sort of got their roles, like who kind of catches the other things? I think I'm always really interested in that. Um, and yeah, and with Into the Wild at the start of this year, we tried to draw up a sort of agreement of how we wanted to work together, like which involved thinking about, yeah, how you communicate, like what you can expect from one another. And I think that was really useful um because it's sort of easy to forget or to, to assume that maybe everybody has the same understanding of how you cooperate um i've just got a couple more minutes and i just wanted to see whether um you ha could tell everybody a little bit more about the like mesh wiki because i think uh das and sam i mean sorry um because i think that is a really good example of trying to extend outwards beyond the group i think that was the sort of first impetus wasn't it like so we're this group of 14 people and we're learning all these things but how can we share that beyond the the kind of selected artists to other people that it might be relevant to um yeah did you want to start on that jess or sam <laughs> yes yeah, so the um the mesh wiki is i didn't even know before that a wikipedia anyone can set up a, a wikipedia page and it's um like by its very nature it's it's open and collaborative so anyone with an account can add any information or take any information off there so we started one but obviously we're not really the creators because hopefully it will just keep evolving as people will um, add more and more information it should hopefully be information which is useful for emerging um, artists but also just anyone interested in creativity and in like creative ecosystems in their local areas and then i think it have just summed up pretty well i don't know it, it, to me it felt like it was just kind of bearing witness to the conversations we were having um and they felt like so important so relevant um as each week went by that kind of uh it felt like an impetus to share those um but also yet yeah, and to not also stop and to ensure that I didn't stop once like our session stopped so kind of like um reaching out with kind of yeah we went to the um toma um and yeah but basically being able to try and yeah like widen the network even more so like mesh it all together <laughs> yeah I really like that term <laughs> yeah and I think there was a lot of, of conversation during our discussions about like decentralizing things especially like decentralizing things away from London and kind of dispersing resources and um and when I say resources, it's also like knowledge as well, right? Like not just kind of money or equipment. Um, but yeah, I should also mention that it was with Esther McManus, um, who sort of uh, worked alongside the program this year, who set up the wiki page. She's a really good artist and um, educator. And um, yeah, it was it was like... I think it's probably in its infancy, it's probably got some big gaps and things. So um, if you want to add to it, if you've got things that you'd like to share or things to find out, because you can also ask questions on there, like anybody got any good 
concrete mix recipes <laughs> um, and it's quite yeah diverse in the stuff that's on um, so I think we've got a couple minutes left on this section I didn't know whether other um, uh, jamboree speakers had anything to say in relation to what's been brought up as a sort of final remark <laughs> No. Um, Emma, is that you? Hello. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I was just, I was just saying, like, the it was great when you came down to visit, um, and really also um, enjoyed seeing this kind of uh, mesh Wikipedia wiki wiki site. Um, I love that idea, and have been sharing it, and I think, yeah, everyone, everyone needs to add to it. Um, and also, some people were saying in the chat as well. Um, that there was a, a ripple from the Solid, Solidarity Syndicate in Wales, and there was definitely one um, in South End as well. Um, we've us as a community in South End that is quite a small art community, and we work really closely together. But we've actually started uh, collaborating and sharing resources um, more heavily, um, which is yeah really fantastic. We're, like me, Lou, and Bella are all currently sitting in the old waterworks. So Toma are just a, uh, just got a. Uh, commission to do a big collaborative project together kind of inspired by solidarity syndicate so we're sharing the money um and resources and stuff um so sharing is caring yes <laughs> um anyway i'm gonna shut up now um and just say thank you to everyone for um coming and sharing their experience um, and their knowledge um and i think um this chat is definitely going to be saved um so because there's loads of great information in this um, yeah, did anyone else want to add anything before I hand over to Chloe? I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in. I'm gonna come in, but I don't know it well. <laughs> I thought that is super powerful. Yeah, we've got some clapping reactions. If anybody wants to react with their button, with those hands in that corner. Thank you so much to all the invited speakers, to the chairs, to everybody contributing in the chat, to people adding links, to people sitting and listening people taking a break that was fantastic i feel really excited and i'm loving this kind of ripple um unsettling the ocean kind of wave of energy um metaphor um so let's keep with that extended metaphor um people are clapping and thanking thank you so much yeah um as emma said the the um, chat is going to be saved there's loads and loads of links in there please pop your links in there Put your contact details as well. We've got people sharing details, asking for people to contribute to discussions after this event today. Thank you so much. That was really exciting. Um, I always, in moments like this, I always feel like I want to just like shut my eyes and sit on the floor and write like a, like a to-do list, like a mega list of what I'm going to do, um, inspired by the people that I've just heard. So there will be an opportunity to do that at some point. We're coming up to a break.